Okay, it is November, and since it's November, it makes sense to cover a series that probably would have been better to cover in October, but I was busy with Jujutsu Kaisen, and since we're approaching a midway point on that, let's go ahead and get into something else. Castlevania. Now, I like Castlevania a lot. It is one of my favorite animated series, and it is technically an anime, but it offers a lot both in writing and animation and just everywhere. So let's go deep into it, particularly its new spinoff. So Castlevania Nocturne was announced quite a while ago and only came out in this past October. And the first thought of Castlevania having a sequel was, I can't wait. See, Castlevania was such an amazing series in terms of writing, animation, character development, all across the board. Not to mention, it was one of the few, and it still remains one of the few good series that you can absolutely go to on Netflix and experience something great every time. So a sequel to that series was... A, going to be awesome, but it was going to have a lot to live up to. And considering I just finally finished it, I can give you a bit of a review on it. Now we're going to get into other stuff in other videos, such as character development, world building, lore building, because I think in general that seems to do better on this channel, but a review is always a good place to, ch to start. So let's go with that. I suppose it makes sense to start with this as a standalone series rather than covering it as a sequel at first because while it is a sequel, it is not directly connected to the original Castlevania. Um, and as a series, it is good. The animation is still top tier. I like a lot of the inventiveness around certain powers. They've debuted, debuted some new magic in this series. Um, character development had some ups and downs, but across the board, I would definitely say this is a good series. Uh, in many ways, this functions kind of like how certain Star Wars series and even like Legend of Korra work. It would be a great to good series on its own. It just lives in the shadow of arguably a much more successful, famous, and arbitrarily maybe better, but that's for later. Either way, it had a lot to live up to, and I think it is very good. But let's break it down into some individual components and talk about those. Let's go ahead and start with story, since that is arguably one of the most important parts of any story, actually. Uh, in terms of what it offers, Castlevania Nocturne will definitely satisfy an itch if you have been missing Castlevania. But I would put an asterisk with that, because while I think that the story of Castlevania Nocturne is good, it has some detractors. In particular, while I think the story is good, it is very erratic in the first four episodes in terms of how it comes across. This is partially due to characters, which we'll cover next, but for now, I think that there was a good idea behind the stories here. I just think some of how it was brought to screen was troublesome. In particular, because this series actually has, like, uh, anywhere revolving around five to seven characters at any given time. That's a lot of characters to try and maintain. Keep in mind that while there were other characters in the original, there were basically five in any season. You had Sypha, Trevor, Alucard, then you had Dracula, and then you would usually have, in any episode, usually Isaac or Carmilla. So there were some other secondary characters that were obviously very important, but any of those characters would usually at least be a primary focus. Here, you're splitting across a lot of characters. You have Marie, you have Richter, you have Annette, you have Annette's friend whose name I struggle with because I have a hard time with French. You know, you struggle with, you have Orox, you have Mizak, you have... Uh, Elizabeth Bafoy, you have her second lieutenant, whose name I also had a hard time with. There are multiple characters in this series, not to mention there's a priest, and there's... It's a lot. It's a lot of characters, and it's not that that's bad, it's just that, particularly in the first three episodes where you do expect that to be laid out really well, it's not. It's a little erratic, and I think that that makes it a little harder to get into than perhaps the original, as the original had a really easy flow that worked you into the series and its characters really well. But, like I said, you do start off with some interesting items. I think in the actual story itself, uh, the concept is simply that, you know, this new generation of heroes has to deal with 
a vampire messiah, which will be a character who, through some means, will allegedly swallow all the light and essentially make it an eternal night for vampires. There were some teasings of this being a possibility in, obviously, the original Castlevania games, as well as even in the original Castlevania series. So, it being here is perfectly fine, and the villain that they picked is an interesting one. I feel that she is kind of on that same intimidating level as Dracula, but we haven't gotten as much time with her yet in the series as perhaps we did with Dracula, which may or may not affect, you know, your feelings around that character. It's kind of the same way I feel like Carmilla got more development in season two. So that again was the struggle and balance of characters in this season. But that basic concept of all these characters is interweaving stories coming together to essentially stop this end of the world both harkens back to the original Castlevania games show and just this general story. So I think that it worked really well. And I think that it offers good opportunities for future seasons. Cause we already know season two is coming. So if story was erratic in terms of how it delivered characters and information, it, but was very good. I feel like it could be easily said that characters worked somewhat similar. Some of these characters are great. They have interesting stories, interesting personalities, and interesting powers and abilities. Others, not so much. I think that they wanted to recapture some of the feelings of the original. They wanted to expand on the idea of the original, enlarging the cast somewhat. And then I think they also had a bit of a hard time deciding exactly how they were going to do that. Um... In terms of our main cast, we don't even have a main trio anymore. We have a main cast. Uh, Richter's the one we're really first introduced to, and he's probably my least favorite. He's not technically awful, but he's not great, Emer. Uh, Richter feels like a very generic version of Trevor. Like, if you were to just kind of describe somebody the general idea of the Belmonts, give them a very basic version of what Trevor was in the first season of Castlevania, that's kind of what Richter is. But he's not nearly as flawed, nuanced, or actually interesting. Uh, I think during the show, I said to somebody I was watching it with that Trevor acted like a dick even though he was actually a nice guy and Richter tries to act like a nice guy even though he's actually kind of a dick so I think that that comes across and yes he has a whole tragic backstory then again so does everyone else in Castlevania it's kind of par for the course if you're in this world so him being the way he is is understandable but not as interesting as it could be and in terms of his power, we'll get to that in the world building segment, but his power is not as interesting as it probably could be. I get what they were going for, but it still could have been done better. Which brings us to Maria, who is obviously the second introduced character. Um, cause if I'm doing these in order, even though I'd rather do them in order of interest, but Maria is, I don't know. If I don't like Richter, I have a hard time whether I'm placing Maria above or below him because she is just as annoying and bland. She's, I get her concept. She's kind of, again, she's supposed to harken back to Saifa and being a very outspoken and fighting for the people person. The problem is, is that a, for some reason, all of this cast with the exception of only two characters are like children. Richter seems like he's barely able to drink, and Maria is literally said to be a teenager, and I think she's like 16? Something like that? I'll have to double check on the wiki if they even confirmed it, but they say specifically teenager, so she couldn't go in the bar. So, why are cast or kids in this version, as opposed to the young adult category that the original Castlevania was in? I don't know. But either way, it doesn't help the case that we're supposed to be looking at her as like a revolutionary leader, and she doesn't seem like she should be here. She seems like she should be waiting to go get a driver's license. And while I do like proactive young characters, there's something to be said for the fact that it doesn't quite fit with the vibe in Castlevania, you know? And then there's the fact that while I think her magic is interesting, she can actually summon spirit animals. We don't know how it works again. That'll go into world building, but I feel like a lot of things about her character are, I don't know why she's here. I don't know how it works. And that kind of really is right up to the fact of her plot twist about her family because, you know, Richter and her stay with her mother. There's a twist involving her mother and who her father might or might not be, um, which, to be frank, you'll probably start getting hints of a couple episodes in, even before it's revealed. Um, it's 
it's interesting because you know she's supposed to be maybe Saifa, but then there's another character who we'll talk about next, which is Annette. And Annette is also this archetype. She is a young but older, so actually more experienced and more believable as a leader um, character who has her own signature brand of magic, uh, which is actually at least explained a little bit better. Um, she has a strong personality. She actually has chemistry with Richter. Uh, they try and have, I think it's supposed to be a sibling relationship between Maria and Richter. And there's just no real like interactions between them other than they curse at each other. But when Annette interacts with Richter, she gets a very interesting set of reactions and actions with him. Uh, that speaks to her character, and she, by far and away, has the best story. We talked about how story was a big problem for this series. Annette has the best of backstory, and Annette has some of the best actions and decision making in the series. She does technically have a like a bit of a screw up in the first episode or second episode, actually, but I think it's that fact of she has that mistake and then she bounces back from it that actually harkens back closer to the original Castlevania and makes her an interesting character. So I think that in total, Annette probably came out somewhere in my top three of favorite characters, which is kind of interesting because then I think you have um, Orox. Orox is probably our next most prevalent character who's technically billed as a bad guy, but he actually spends more time helping the good guys than he does being a bad guy. So, But he is actually a vampire from the New World and is an ancient Aztec vampire who can turn into a dragon. I don't know how that works, but it's so cool. Plus, he can turn into Shadow and launch Flaming Skulls. He's also somewhere in the top two for me. He's also interesting because, as far as vampires go, he has the most interesting interaction with humans. Because he fell in love with a human, he's had interesting interactions with another human in the series. He, overall, has this very... He's, it's like his sense of being an immortal. He radiates the same energy as Dracula did. This idea that this being is older and has seen so much, but still finds little interesting things about the world. Um, and then I think the last main character is Mitzak, who is probably the least developed because he kind of joins the party late, only coming in the last few episodes to the good guy side. He was a bodyguard for um, the abbot of the area that they were in. And no, I'm not learning that character's name yet. Cause if he comes back in second season, I'll bother to learn that. But he was interesting. You know, he's the idea of that, that character who dedicates his life to a cause in this case, a church, but then that church's leadership turns out to not be good guys. And he has to make that decision exactly where he stands. It's not fully conveyed like that, but it's enough there that I can say it's far more interesting than what they did with Maria and Richter. So he's definitely also somewhere high up on the list. And as you can see, this is kind of the thing of there are many other side characters like Maria's mother, who's also surrogate mother for Richter. And then, you know, even Elizabeth Baffoy isn't in the series that long. She's more supposed to be hearkened as a impending threat, but we don't get that much time with her. So we'll need more next season, I think, to flesh out her as a character. All in all, I think they did okay with characters, but there were some flubs in this that they'll have to expand on next season if they really want us to get attached to these characters the way we did with the original. And ironically of the last aspect, I wouldn't normally include something like this in a review or it would be smaller, but I feel because Castlevania has one of the most interesting worlds I've ever seen in an anime or in any TV show or visual storytelling for that matter, it's worth expressing how this series conveyed world building. And in some ways I think they screwed up a little. And then in other ways, I think they did a fantastic job of expanding on premises. Um, because there's a couple different items in the series that are interesting. Let's put it this way. Annette's friend from earlier is Edward. See, told you I'd finally remember that he gets turned into serving the enemy later on and how that happens. Okay, I'll put this this way. This is a small spoiler. If you don't want to hear this, just skip ahead just a little bit. But he gets turned into a night creature. And in concept, I think that him getting turned into that was interesting because they allow him to maintain his sense of self. Like, he still ends up behaving as himself. He starts to remember things. That's never happened before. In fourth season, we find out from Isaac that he eventually resurrects somebody who does have memories and he can converse with. And that starts to change his opinion about night creatures a little bit. But, you know, Edward goes even further than that. He can make decisions for himself. He can do a lot of things on his own. He even defies his orders. 
there's so much that could be interesting explored with that that wasn't in this season, but it's a good change because the method of how he was turned into a night creature is drastically different than what we saw in the original Castlevania. And because of that, I feel like that's a good opportunity to explore. Maybe this was a different process for that. So I'm willing to let that ride. But in some other ways, you know, they alter a little bit how certain things work. In particular, it, speakers are a bit weird in the series. Um, in particular, because the way that speakers are portrayed is almost non-existent. I mean, even though a few characters are technically speaker magicians, the speakers themselves aren't present. And uh, throughout the series, a lot of people can use magic, in particular speaker magician magic. And while don't get me wrong, I'm sure there are people in each speaker caravan who can use magic. The degree to which they can use it is a little um weird. Because it feels very cheap, not because they can all use the magic. I mean, in the original magic is just intent with a little bit of education and a little bit of willpower. Anybody could do magic. That's fine. But they seem to have cut down on the effectiveness of said magic in order to justify multiple people having it in the show. And that's just a tad bit disappointing. I'm not going to lie. The only reason I can assume there might also be more people now is that Sypha might have encouraged more her people to take up magic. But if that's true... I don't get why you would debuff the magic itself to make it weaker. The whole point is that she would want people to learn it to make them safer. So that was a significant asset, you know, aspect of it. I was going to say asset. In some ways it is an asset. But then we also got new magics introduced in the series, you know, like Annette's form of magic that comes from her ancestors. Because apparently she's descended from gods, which sound frankly awesome. And makes me wonder if that'll have anything to do with the infinite corridor. Um... But, you know, she's essentially able to, on her father's side, wield earth and metal, which is fantastic. We've never had somebody that could do that in the show. It's explained that because of a hereditary trait, she can do that, which I'm not great with hereditary magic in this series. Every aspect of magic has always been stated to be an education, although some magic could be affected by your living status. For example, there couldn't be a vampire forge uh, master, for example, but nothing about this has been genetic, and I'm not happy about that being introduced, but it's not that she instantly got earth powers. She still had to train with a priestess and learn. So it's basically the similar to how we're depicted of Hector and Sypha being somewhat magic prone as children. And they just refine that ability. So I think it didn't break anything. It just works really well for introducing a whole new concept of magic to the series, which looked awesome. Um, in, in regards to, like, establishing previous lore and where this sits, 300 years is a long time, so I wasn't expecting a lot of connections back to the old series, and there are some, there are some, in particular, for some reason, the whip got handed down. I have no idea why the whip, not the Morning Star, got handed down, because the Morning Star was the more prevalent weapon, but okay. Um, in particular, also, all the Belmonts now have magic because of Sypha's bloodline. Again, magic was never tied to bloodlines, but that seems to be a bit of a change they're trying to institute. I'm not a big fan of it, but it's there. Um, in regards to like other stuff, like ironically, this is called Castlevania. Castlevania doesn't appear in it, at least not yet. The castle itself is not present. It may appear at some point, which I would certainly love if it did. It's kind of a character almost onto itself, and one of the few characters that could still exist 300 years later. So I would like at least a cameo of that at some point. Um, they do a good job. I mean, I think Elizabeth Buffoy was a good pick. She's a real world historical figure that did do awful things. The level of which she did awful things is debated among historians, but she wasn't exactly a good noble woman. And much like Vlad Dracula Tepesh, there's a, you know, narrative you can interweave with that. Um, in regards to how she acts in the story, I think we'll get more development on it next season, but in terms of like where she gets all this power and stuff, it wasn't really explained, but I didn't think it needed to be, at least not yet. We'll probably get more of that next season. Um, yeah, this was a good series. I think that trying to overlay it into the French Revolution may have caused more issues than it necessarily intended to. You know, in the original, it's set in Wallachia in the 1400s. I'm not pulling out a historical book to look up what was happening in that time period to see if, you know, it occurred within anything that would have happened in that time period. Uh, whereas the French Revolution is something we are aware of. It's post-American Revolution, which means it's very close to us in real-world time. 
And because of that, I feel like there has an opportunity to interweave more things into it, but also maybe kind of holds it back in some ways because they're not sure how to do that yet. That might improve in next seasons, or they might drop that angle altogether and not reference it. Only time will tell. In the whole, I think world building was done well, but some things are being changed that I'm not a fan of, and some things just need to be explained better. But again, that's what more seasons are for. So would I recommend watching Castlevania Nocturne? Yes. Yes, I would. There were some things that I left out of this because I didn't really want to do any spoilers in it. There's a big twist at the end of the show, and even if you're not a fan of the concept of the show, stick it out till the end because there is a big reward for longtime fans of this series. So I would highly recommend it with an asterisk that... It's not as good as the original, and I would definitely call it Castlevania Light or Diet Castlevania. Yes, the flavor's close, but it's just off enough that you can tell the difference. Anyway, I'll talk to you next time about whatever we're going to get into. It's an all-new section of animation, so let's go.